week that we're looking at I have got a lot of gossip about. <laughs> but we'll start out with this first discussion here. How do artists, artists show shared power? So we've looked at works in the past that have uh, one person in power. How do you think an artist can show two people in power? Yeah. So, um, are the artists themselves collaborate? Um, but what about the subject? So, say you have a picture, and you're trying to show both people are in power. Yeah, so um, uh, that could work as well. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, one famous work that shows an interesting form of shared power. Before we dive into it, though, I'm going to allow you to ask a question about this work. One thing that might strike your curiosity. Yes, they are. Great. Um, you picked up on it. <laughs> These are the royal couple here, and um, this is Justinian and Theodora. So these are their names. Um, huge impact on history, but also um, they were sort of uh, one of the big power couples in our history, too. Uh, people never talk about them separately. They're always together. Um, before I dive into the talk, though, I want you to help me out with this list here. Um, what are some signs of their power? And I'm going to add one to the top because this image is poor resolution, so people don't always pick up on it. But the um, background, background um, is painted gold. So that's going to be one of my symbols of power right here. If you see any other symbols of power, you can write it down in the list. There's definitely more than one.
Hi, Elizabeth. We are looking at the artwork we see right here and um, writing out symbols of power. So what is a power symbol here? There's lots of them in this piece. It's a very powerful couple. Yes, they're definitely showing off their, their wealth in the jewelry and the outfits. And then, can anyone recognize this giant circle around the king right here? What do you think that is? We see in a lot of artwork kind of starting at this era. The sun, um, yeah, that's one interpretation of it. But I'll give you a hint here. The religion that... Uh, the king and queen here practice is Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, holy. It's a holy symbol. What's that called when it's a circle around it behind the angel's head? Yeah, right. Beyonce knows it. <laughs> Excellent. So they're showing a lot of wealth here in materials, and that's a form of power. They're also showing the gold bricks. Um, um, the actual literal materials here are also expensive. And we even know that this is a um, Christian king and queen based on the halo behind his head. Um, something interesting here, the, their faces don't actually look like this in real life. This is another evidence of that word canon that we talked about last week. So a canon or a rule in that every painting from this era has similar faces, similar skin tones, right? This skin tone is so pale um, it says that they're allergic to the sun, right? <laughs> this is almost in the albino territory. Um, this is, in fact, uh, how you would show aristocracy. So always using pure white paint, even if their skin was not, in fact, pure white. Um, and what we see here is an indication of where we are. Um, uh, our city that these two, this couple is from is Constantinople which is current day Istanbul, which is the perfect sort of um, crossroads between the East, yes, Justinian. Um, it's a perfect crossroads between the East and West, right? So and it's pretty close uh, to many seas, but especially the Mediterranean. And you can see here with the shape of the eyes, they're almost the same on husband and wife. Um, but it's something that we start to know as the Mediterranean eye, even if a person's eye doesn't exactly look like this, they'll always depict these sort of heavily lined lids. So it always looks like people have eyeliner on. You see it today in a lot of our movies, actually. If you, you know, it's just Hollywood for sure. Um, Hollywood calls it whitewashing, where they get a white actor uh, who is not from that area, <laughs> and they put a whole bunch of bronzer on the actor and then do these heavily lined eyes to make them look Egyptian or Mediterranean in some way. It's something that's been changing in Hollywood as people have become more aware, but it is a sign of where you are in terms of art history and the world if you see eyes that are heavily uh, lined like this. And that goes right into our tea and context and boy do I have the tea for you guys today. Um, before I dive in, has anyone heard about Our Lady here, uh, Empress Theodora, before I start? You can give me a yes or a no. Yes, okay. So Elizabeth, you might know some of this. And different history teachers just tell it different ways. So I'm going to try and use some discrete language, but I think you guys can pick it up on this, a little bit of her story. And that's really what this is about. Um, as I was telling Graceland earlier, this couple um, were not really known for their differences. They actually, in fact, were more known for working together, and that is because of this lady here. 
And normally, when an emperor marries um, a wife, uh, what does her background have to be? What do you think? You, we tell it in our own folk tales. She has to be some form of nobility, right? Um, Theodora's father was, in fact, a cobbler. Mm -hmm. Theodora's father was a cobbler, which means he made shoes, right? So he did not have very much money, and he actually did not have a dowry for Theodora. And what's a dowry? You guys might have heard of this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is sometimes also called a bride price. So it's essentially since another family is taking on another mouth to feed, the family that gives her up also has to send something with her. Normally this is something like um, if it's uh, a less wealthy nation or person, they'll uh, hand over like a goat or something like a chicken or two or something smaller. But the wealthier you are, the larger your bride price has to be. In theory, if you had a larger dowry, that's the only way in which you can move up in class and get out of poverty. It's just like someone in your family struck it rich and is being very generous to you. Um, so Theodora didn't have a dowry at all. So what kind of occupations are there for women in the ancient world? Yeah, very true. Sometimes the, the men's side also pays a dowry as well in like exchange for said bride because once again the family's giving up an asset to their household. But I'll ask you guys just like if you don't have any money for a dowry, what kind of job do you end up in as a woman in this ancient world? I'm talking about like six or seven hundred AD. This is two hundred years. A servant, if you're lucky, yeah. If you're lucky you can be a servant. But even a servant often has to marry into that class. Um, what if you have no skills as a servant? What's next? What's the next uh, pull down that you can go as a job? Mm-hmm. Right. So let me just hit it. That's like the bottom pull of work you can get. And it was not an unpopular job. There were many in the ancient world who had to go about that just because of how the culture was set up. Um, kind of right above it, believe it or not, between those two roles that you provided is something like an entertainer, right? In this time in history, um, only men were allowed to entertain in the Byzantine Empire, meaning if you wanted to act, if you wanted to sing, all that, you, could, you were only allowed to do it if you were a man. So any woman who would act or sing or dance in a, like a non-festival manner, but like privately, was also considered kind of in between that, between a servant and a prostitute. And Theodora was that. She was an entertainer. She got into that, and she would dance and act for uh, private audiences. And how she met Justinian, uh, he was quite young then, so like then you're like 17, 18, um, just a prince at this point, not even a king, and certainly not an emperor yet. Um, he was visiting a duke's house, so a man of high power, um, or maybe it was a general. It doesn't really matter. It's kind of semantics, but um, he was in visit. He was visiting a man of higher power's house, and he hired Justinian. I'm sorry, he hired. Theodora to come in and perform and entertain for a small audience. And Justinian watched her and fell in love. He became obsessed with Theodora and eventually he married her. So this is an early Christian empire where Eastern, Eastern Orthodox is the religion right now. Considering what you know, especially what you can think about like early, especially early Christian, do you think that the people were okay with having a princess and then a queen and then an empress with this background? Oh, really? Yeah, they were not okay. 
But Theodora knew people. This was her strength. She knew exactly what people wanted and how to give it to her and help her out in all other aspects of her life. Uh, Justinian actually wasn't very much of a people person. He could not really connect with the lower classes, but Theodora was from them. So what she did, and this is why uh, she talked about so much still today, is this first deed in her power, is she closed every whorehouse and brothel in Constantinople, and sadly because of the times, there were many. And she gave each woman a brand new dress and a bag of money, which would equate to a pretty good dowry. So what did she truly give these women? Mm-hmm. They had a whole new life. This is all you really needed. Yeah, life and hope. This is all you really needed at the time was a dowry and then a new dress to show that you were, like, obviously you, weren't, you were hard to recognize. Um, do you think the people were then excited by her? Yeah. So she turned everyone's opinion with this great deed. And um, this is one of those deeds, too, in history that we don't really know the full scale of it. Um, it's uh, it's kind of like a compilation of a lot of rumors, but she won the hearts of the people where her husband Justinian never could have. And this kind of uh, continues throughout their story in their lifetime. Justinian was an emperor eventually um, and was running a whole bunch of territories. Um, he had a whole lot of wealth coming in, uh, but there was also a striking amount of poverty and plague at this time. There was a plague during their life. Um, and Cities react differently, but the city had enough of a population to try and riot against Justinian and Theodora. This was like 20 years or so into their marriage at this point. Um, and Justinian was ready to run away. He was ready to give up Constantinople and leave. But Theodora said, no, I will not run away from a mob. I will stand here, hold my ground, and we'll get through it. And then there's like this legendary scene where she walks out onto um, – was kind of like a balcony porch and uh, looks over her people and is able to calm them down, calm down the mob. Um, and so Theodora actually lived a pretty long life, especially in ancient terms. And I think they actually found her uh, remains and analyzed that she actually ended up dying of cancer, of all things, uh, which we forget that exists in the ancient world, but, you know, lifespans were so short that normally it didn't... Um, we don't see a whole bunch of signs of it progressing because there are so many other things that could also kill you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Theodora uh, lives I, what we would consider a, a somewhat normal death today, uh, but was quite unusual back then. And she was truly loved in her time, but it's, um, you know, she came from like truly rags to riches, which is why I think we all study her so much today because that's very hard. And it said, because there was actually a whole bunch of um, many women who had power in her era, I believe. Um, so in many, in many, and actually even in some countries today, but in many parts of the ancient world, um, if a husband died, a woman would not inherit his property. Um, instead, it would go to his next descendant, and a woman has to marry someone else. Under Theodora's and Justinian's reign, a woman didn't have to do that, so if the husband passed or something, uh, the woman could still retain property and didn't have to remarry. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's, that's the tea on Theodora. She came uh, from quite uh, seedy means, but now um, you know, she's really honored today, especially in the area as well, which today is sample. Okay. So in this next video here. Sorry for all the links. <laughs> I copy pasted it in and then it wouldn't let me uncopy paste it. So this is a short video about the mosaic process because we were just looking at a mosaic. And it's a little bit more involved than what you would think. Definitely more involved than like a craft, um, the craft kit that you'd get at an AC more or something. And it's only three minutes and 33 seconds, but I will put a timer on, I'll say for 3.30. And if you guys could type while you watch and tell me something that surprises you about the process here. You will definitely see it's more involved than we normally realize, but this is in person recreating 
the Byzantine style mosaic. Yeah. Excellent. First comment there. Uh, he put in the stones by himself one by one. Um, it's a pretty time con it's time consuming, but you also have to work pretty fast because that material that binds the stone together um, is going to start drawing very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what I think helps to create that crisp, clean edge, the fact that he painted it before he set the set of the stones. Excellent work, guys. I think it's always fun to find someone who's done the thing that you're looking at. So this next bit right here is our cultural uh, canons. So what is, is an image of people show, um, sorry, what is an image showing people with equal power? And we can go into our lovely Google and post an image up here. Um, I'm to type in if I write shared power. Hit images. If you can find an image, oh, nope, shared power to please. Oh, <laughs> um, we have some infographics here, but let's look for photography. So you can copy an image, right click copy, and then paste it on the wall here to share. Ooh, this came up. I just typed in shared power. Let me try and minimize it. Hmm. 
I'm curious to see what you guys can find. So I challenge you guys when you're looking at, when you come across an advertisement showing someone who's working for a business or uh, anything that has multiple people in it, try to determine who the photographer wants you to think is most powerful. You know, we see that all the time, um, uh, especially in like, I would always think of um, the back of a phone book. Um, I don't know if y'all have seen that in a while, but the back of the phone book, there's always some sort of law firm that's advertising uh, their lawyers, and there's one person who's stepping forward. I mean, sometimes you'll find a law firm that has multiple people, but they all have equal power, and they're all in the same line. Ooh, band pictures. Those are great. So if you have a famous band with several people in it, the main singer, always towards the foreground, right? They're always like the focus, and then the other band members are just kind of moping behind them. So now let me think about that. I'm going to look up a band, too. I was playing this group before class started. This is the Whalen Jennies right here. You can really see that they've made one person the target of the image. But these other two have equal power. Oh, that's a good example. What's this group? Newsboys. Why does that sound familiar? Are they a newer or an, or an older act? Okay, nice. Oh, an old one? I get you there. Oh, do they have like many members coming and going? I get you. Greenson, can you think of anyone? Who are these? This person looks familiar. Actually, both of these guys look like they could be brothers. Panic at the Disco! Of course, I should know this one. <laughs> they were big back in my day. Have they had like a resurgence recently? I think they have. I don't listen to the radio as much as I used to, so I'm not always in on who's cool or who's making new stuff. Good job, guys. Yeah, I would say Panic at the Disco, he's the focus, the um, gold jacket, but yet they're all kind of in a line together. So that's really cool. And uh, same thing with the newsboys right here. They're all, their heads are all at the same height, which is a good way of showing equality, yet this um, one figure is in the foreground. And that means that he's probably more important of the members. Probably. Okay, so this is a group right here. They are meant to be jarring. Notice that the bright yellow background and the black and white text. This is a famous painting right here that they put a gorilla mask on top of. Um, this was a group of artists, um, what we would call action artists or performance artists, um, that in the 80s and early 90s, really tried to make the public aware of how little power women had in art history and even in current history, even though you know the majority of the art world is in fact dominated by women. 
So they would do these things where they would do some simple Photoshop towards famous paintings and then this kind of reminds me of like tea party posters right here, the same color theme, um, the yellow background and black text, but it was meant to get your attention. And they'd have, uh, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And then they always give you a statistic. So less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Um, so my question for you guys uh, is what happens when artists judge art history? Right here. So this is, this is a work of art, but it also is a sticker and like a bumper sticker. And they would cover the streets of New York and it went viral and went all, uh, the early, early versions of viral. You know, it was the 90s. So <laughs> wasn't that viral yet. But these women would also do um, other more political acts. They would do performances. They would show up, but they would always be anonymous and wear these gorilla masks. And um, they were called the Gorilla Girls, which sounds like a band too, but it is not. I'll tell you right here. They're more doing a play on guerrilla warfare. We're working from the lower levels up. Um, so do you consider this, for one, to be a work of art? Um, and lastly, do you think um, it is our role as artists to also judge art history? Any art is art. Do you think it's technically art? Mm -hmm. It depends on your point of view. How do you think, so maybe this image really isn't too jarring to us right now, but how do you think people in the late 80s and early 90s even felt about seeing these things? Imagine that you are sitting back in your blazer that has arm pads or shoulder pads in it so that you look even more masculine. How do you feel as a woman at this time if you came by this statistic in this work? This isn't so long ago for us. Yeah, totally. That's a great observation, Elizabeth. Yeah, and you can even, like, you'll find yourself continuing to think about this even now. Like, I've seen this image, of course, hundreds of times, but every time I actually read it, I'm like, oh, wow. And just that, um, you know, I'll give you this statistic as well. If you were to go to, say, an art college or an arts university, I went to VCU. Um, which had a pretty good ratio, but still, about 70% of the arts program is always women and 30% male. And then if you're going into the museum industry, that a similar statistic exists. About 60% of the museum uh, staff is women, 40% male. And yet, if you're to go into a museum itself, we still have a pretty shockingly low amount of women work available, even though women were still creating and working for a long time. 
So that means, you know, we you can determine that many women who are creating and building and running these businesses are still not showing uh, women uh, art by women. And since the Guerrilla Girls have come out, they've really made a change to an art world. That statistic has definitely changed from the 5%. But it's certainly not 50, 50, 50 even today. Um, and some would say, you know, well, that's because we live, you know, we're looking at older works from a different time. Hi, Erin. You just jumped in on a big conversation. <laughs> Um, uh, this is a fun time to come in. I am showing this work, this artwork right here, by a group of artists, a collective of artists called the Gorilla Girls. And um, they made this piece and they were really working to sort of jar the public and have them think about the art world and who was represented. Um, and I was just, we were getting into some current events here. Um, but you know, we were showing different forms of power in the piece we saw today. And that's, I'm going to scroll back to it real quick. You'll see that even though Theodora had more sway with the public and had a lot of power politically, she was never seen as Justinian's equal, right? And what's our one sign or two signs here that she is not his equal? Smaller, no halo, right? He. Um, uh, it has like this very religious, holy symbol here that she is denied. Um, and she is never can be as tall as him, even if in real life she is as tall or even taller. So I can go back into here. She is in front of him. Very good point. So there is a negotiation here, right? There, she still has quite a lot of power for women of this time. So good, great observation, Elizabeth. And you see, when we start to really know the context and all the uh, information behind the artwork, we can really just see a lot more of what's going on. Okay, so uh, how can we describe the style and process? Um, Aaron, I'm not going to put this on you because you just came aboard, but let's see. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you take the style today and then Grayson, you can take the process. Thank you, guys. So, Erin, I'm definitely going to save this recording um, in case you want to see it later. I really recommend that you go to when I start giving a tea in context because I have quite a lot of tea to spill on this one. Um, this is an interesting image, more about the lives of the subjects, I would say. But it does add to our interpretation of the story. Or, yeah, Byzantine Empire. Excellent. Byzantine is just fun to say. We should all say Byzantine. <laughs> That's fine. Totally fine, Erin. Thank you for coming. Gold and precious jewels. Mosaic, right? And if you want to describe, um, a lot of us will remember it, but the eye there. I don't know if you remember what we called that eye. Yeah, the Mediterranean eye. Mm -hmm. And this is just when we're, um, you'll start hearing Holy Roman Empire start to come out. Clay-like substance. Mosaics are really chunky, but this piece still exists today. Um, uh, Justinian built a whole lot of structures, and they would have his their images um, um, put up inside of them. Anything else you want to add before we move on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Theodora had a lot of power in her time, but just looking at this image, you can still see um, how the power was organized in the empire. So she still had to defer to her husband for all things. Have you heard of this piece before, Erin? Or of the rulers? Okay. Yep, you're good. Bye. <laughs> cool. All right. 
give me a check if we're good to move to the next slide. Okay, awesome. So we have compare and contrast. So you can, um, I can't remember if both of you guys were here for last week's one, but it's pretty easy to come up with some contrast for these. <laughs> right. Um, let's see, yeah, if you guys want to add in the things that are different, and then we'll make the overlapping things that are similar, which are going to be very general. They both have faces. And it's kind of cool, you're also seeing like rulers versus soldiers, right? Mm. Ooh, yeah, religious. You know, both are signs of wealth of a ruler, too, though, right? Excellent. You guys are doing great here. Give me a check for whenever you're ready to move on. Yeah. Yeah, well, technically, yeah, you're in a, a, a tricky area with um, the Eastern Europea, European becomes Eurasian, that like similar, similar language there. I believe they even called this, in ancient Rome, they would call this area Asia Minor which is a weird way to write it, but it was like Little Asia. So it's a funny crossover there that I don't think that a lot of people know about, but we kind of, we are aware of in some ways. Okay, so how do you think this work impacted the art world? You, know, you can start to think about all the other rulers that followed them. Show of power. Yeah, the halo to represent. Showing wealth. Excellent. So you guys can give me a check whenever you're ready to move on. All right, so we've hit the last slide. How does knowing about this work and any of the work that we looked at today, including the Gorilla Girls piece, um, how does it impact you? How do you think? Um, how have your thoughts changed? I will end this with a song, too.
Yes, you're right. Even today, people are still working for equality. In the world as well, not just the art world. Apparently, High Hopes is Spotify's um, most popular song for Panic at the Disco. Let's see. I will look up the most popular song for the news boys. Yeah. <laughs> That's their big one, right? Yes. Great job, guys. Yeah, everything is kind of still happening, which is a bummer, but also a great thing. <laughs> I'm going to turn off the recording.